All right, we're on lesson number seven, lesson number seven for the church, and uh, I kind of alluded to this on Sunday morning. I preached on this topic Sunday morning, and so uh, there's a couple things in here that are going to come up that I kind of want to get to, think about, we'll look at as discussion at the end tonight here, but Roman numeral number one there, what is the church? What is the church? The church means a called out assembly. Of course, it's not a physical building or denomination. Uh, the words used in two ways in the New Testament. So the letter A there, the universal church, and letter B is going to be the local assembly. But let's look at that universal church first. The universal church is made up of all saved people everywhere. And we're going to look at some verses as we go down through here in just a minute. But let's start with that. The universal church is made up of all saved people everywhere. I don't, if the board uh, members that are here tonight remember, uh, that actually came up as a as a question that some folks had maybe two years ago, maybe it's been a little longer than that, uh, but we had a family start to attend our church. Uh, they were very, um, they, they had some very unusual positions on a number of things. But one of the things he came and he made an appointment with me and he came in here uh, one weekday and sat in my office and uh, was most upset because our bylaws stated that we believe the church is bigger than just our local assembly. We believe the church is everyone who knows Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And he really argued that. He, according to him, we had to either take that out of our bylaws or he was leaving the church. And, well, he's not here anymore. So uh, I, I told him, I said, I said I've never heard, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a fairly young guy. I've never heard anybody argue that before. Um, he's like, well, universal church gives the idea of a Catholic church. I said, well, no, no, no. I understand they might use some of that terminology. I said, but universal church. Uh, is just the fact that everyone uh, who's a part of the bride of Christ, who's part of the body of Christ, makes up the church. The Lord's going to come back and rapture the church. Um, his theology on that, his thinking on that, was that it's not the church until we're in heaven. And, you know, I don't think the Bible states that at all. So we're going to look at some of those verses. So I'm, I'm emphasizing that to say that's something that I read, maybe you and I read tonight, and we go, well, no kidding. Yet there's people that come into our church that don't understand that or, or misinterpret that or misunderstand that. So I thought we'd look at uh, some of these verses here tonight. Number one, uh, under letter A, this is the church which Christ founded, Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18. I'm going to turn to these and, um, and read them right away, read them as quickly as I can. Matthew 16, 18, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, we understand, you know, Peter is going to be the man that preaches at Pentecost and will become the first pastor there um, uh, in Jerusalem uh, right after that. We understand Peter's role. Um, of course, we just mentioned the Catholic Church. They interpret this and... Uh, name Peter as the first pope, right, and, and put a, an extra, um, I'll say some uh, extra divine characteristics on him uh, that, that are not there, of course. But uh, we see Peter being used mightily of God uh, as the first pastor of the first church there in Jerusalem, a church that will send out missionaries, a church that will have an influence a lot of places. But anyway, um, this is the foundation of the church. Christ is forming his church. And I I think the emphasis here, and I, I've said this a lot, in the Old Testament, God used a nation. He used a people group, the Israelites. But in the New Testament, he's using an institution. He's using the church. And so big, big, big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in, as far as how he's showing his, his glory and how he's going to get his, his word, I'm sorry, his name made known to the world. And so in the Old Testament, a nation. Old New Testament, an institution, that's the church. So that's the universal church that we're talking about. Number two, a universal church consists, I'm sorry, constitutes the spiritual body of Christ. So over in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, uh, I'm not going to read all these, but I want to read a couple of these just to set the foundation here. Ephesians 1, uh, 22 and 23, and he hath put all things under his feet, talking about Jesus Christ. You see that in verse 20. He has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. 
So that's the, the universal church, all the believers. Number three, an individual becomes part of this body through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is, when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we defined that baptism of the Holy Spirit, I think, in Lesson 3. Uh, but that is accepting Jesus Christ as Savior, not having nothing to do with water baptism. This is being baptized into the body of Christ. That is a spiritual transaction uh, when we become a, a, a believer. Number four, membership in a local church has no bearing on one's membership in the body of Christ. It's entirely possible to be a member of a local church, still go to hell if you've never been saved. Of course, and, uh, and vice versa. Thank goodness we're part of the body of Christ and part of the bride of Christ and part of the church, even if we don't join our local church, right? It works both ways. And I think that's important. Number five, there are three primary pictures of the church in the New Testament. And I've alluded to two of these three already, but the first one is a body, Romans 12, 4 to 5. I'm not going to turn or read these, but first we're part of the body of Christ. Uh, let her be there. We're part of the building. You know, he's forming us, he's building us, he's constructing us. And then let her see, of course, we are part of the bride. And uh, that has prophetic implications. You know, we are preparing ourselves as the bride for Jesus Christ when he comes back to claim his bride. There will be a marriage ceremony. There will be a marriage supper, a reception. Uh, all those things will happen, not figuratively, literally. We're part of the bride, part of the body, part of the building. Those three examples that we see. Letter B, local church. Group of believers gathered in a specific geographical location. So it's very important to understand the truth about the universal church. However, the vast majority, or more than 100 references to the word church in the New Testament, are references to a local assembly. So individual local churches. Every member of the universal church should be a member of a local, of course, and whatever we might learn about the body of Christ from the New Testament is most consistently and effectively carried out within a local church. And so he's given us, and again, I mentioned this on Sunday, and I'm not going to elaborate, but he gave us the, the job, local church, of um, performing the ordinances of baptism and communion. Uh, it gave us a responsibility to, to grow and to evangelize and missions. And all those things are part of the local ch church's job, as well as, of course, the body as a whole. We, I think we understand that. Number two, Roman numeral two. And this is the one that I kind of teased on Sunday a little bit. What is the purpose of the church? And so uh, this outline is something that's been around for a long time. It's uh, put out by a church in Alabama. Uh, it's a good church, a very um, um, big church and well-respected church that does a lot of stuff. They put this whole discipleship series out free of charge. They want other churches to use it, just download it and use it. So I'm using theirs, and, um, and uh, uh, obviously it's not mine, it's theirs. We're using it. But that doesn't mean I agree with necessarily the order of how they do everything. And so I don't think there's any false information, but we might rearrange it a little bit. How's that? Uh, what is the purpose of the church? Acts 2, 41 to 47, we get a description of the practice of the early church. And so I wanted to read that. Let's start Acts 2, 41 to 47. There's several verses there. I think these are really important as we see the beginning um, references to the church in the New Testament. Acts 2, 41 to 47. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. All that believed were together. They had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods. They parted them to all men as every man had need. They, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness, and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so there's a lot of information in those six verses there as we go down through and, uh, and see what they do, how they conducted themselves, and how God uh, poured out his power upon this new organization. So it says here, what's the purpose of the church? A, first and foremost, is, is to teach the word. And so, I again, on Sunday, I backed that up a little bit. I believe first and foremost, our duty is to glorify God. 
because that is the first and foremost duty of all mankind. And so we're to glorify God. Uh, One of the things that I think has changed, and I think we see it in this passage, and so uh, let me elaborate on this. In the book of Acts, and I think up until maybe even early in the 20th century, the church, as as an evangelistic um, tool of God, would go out and, and be a witness. They would go out and share the gospel with, with people, however they did that in different, uh, different generations, through the things they wrote, through people going out and talking, uh, through uh, missions, uh, through all the things they did. They were an evangelistic uh, lighthouse to their community as they went out. People would get saved. People would, would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then those people would come with them to church and would grow multiply the church numbers where they in turn would go out and reach people. I think we've seen a lot at the end of the 20th century and especially in the 21st century that churches have changed the mindset of to this. We want to be attractive to the world so the world will come into the church and get saved. And I, I think that is hurting the church, right? Our first and foremost duty is not is not to um, get unsaved people to come to church. Our duty as a Christian is to witness to unsaved people. Sometimes they'll get saved in us talking to them. Sometimes we go and get the preacher and have him come and help us. Uh, Sometimes we do end up talking them into coming to church, and they end up getting saved at church, and that's great. But it's not, you know, it's it's this new uh, purpose-driven church mentality of, we have to make the church attractive to the world. So we got to get them uh, an appearance that they like, a setting that they like, coffee that they like, you know, a band that they like, all this stuff so the world is attracted to the church so that they'll, they'll want to come in and then we can give them the gospel. You know, I understand their philosophy. I just don't think that's what they did here in the book of Acts. So let's go back to uh, verse 41. They that received the word were baptized and the same day were added unto them 3,000 souls. So people accepted the gospel, they were baptized, they were added to the church. Then they continued steadfastly in the doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, in prayer. Uh, verse 44, they believed, uh, I'm sorry, all that believed were together, they had all everything in common. Verse 46, they continuing daily with one accord and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So the church got together to, to worship, to learn, to pray, to grow, to help one another. Uh, so he's saying here on the outline, the first foremost role of the church is to teach the word of God. I, I think that is one of the ways, one of the very top ways that we glorify God is by teaching and preaching the word of God. Um, obviously, we can teach and preach the word of God one-on-one. We can teach and preach the word of God to somebody we're sitting next to on an airplane or at a restaurant. We could teach the word of God to someone that, you know, is our neighbor that we talk to across the fence. Um, and so the church is to teach the word of God to the members of the local church so that the local church is empowered to go and share the gospel to everyone you come in contact with. Because the bottom line is this, as much as, as we try, and by we I mean the church in general today, the world's not that interested in just coming to church. <laughs> just off the cuff. They got other things to do. You know, they got other activities. They got other things. They, they just don't want to come to church. You know, it's the old, um, uh, let me, I'll, I'll probably be picking on some of the big uh, mega churches and stuff, to, but, or some of the new contemporary philosophy, but, you know, a big, um, a big mega church that, that has a um, very contemporary worship service, has a professional or semi-professional band, that literally practices several times during the week. They've, they're putting hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, into their sound and audio equipment so that they can put forth this very professional appeal to people. So that when people come in, it can sound like a, it sounds quality, like a concert, you know, that the world's used to. And so I think what happens then is smaller churches, let's say churches our size, see that working at a church that has 4,000 people and decide, well, we need to do that. And so we find some dude in the church that knows how to maybe play a guitar and we hook up a okay microphone 
and think we're going to have a band. And the world's like, no, nah, that's not working for me, right? Because it's entertainment driven. It's entertainment focused. It's, it's entertainment uh, 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 wetting their appetite. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've said, you know, you got the big contemporary church that puts a huge coffee cafe in the lobby. And then, you know, a small church like ours that puts a coffee pot in the lobby, you know, it's not the same thing, you know, it's not the same into the world. Eh, it's not working for me. And so I want to arm you all, all of us, to be a witness when we go out. That's why I want to make sure you all have whatever tracks you need, whatever done books you need, whatever tools you need, that we are confident about our faith. So when we go out and someone says to you, Man, I'm really scared about what's going on in this world today. What do you think? Pastor Wes is saying, ding, 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 there's your opportunity, right? There's the open door. I don't want you to have to say, I have no idea. You should come to church. <laughs> no, no, we have an idea. We should have an idea. We, have, we, have, we, we may, may not have all the answers. Um, I hope you know, Pastor Wes doesn't have all the answers, right? Of course not. The Bible has the answers. But there's people that come in and ask me questions and, you know, I don't know. You know, you look, you look across the room to someone like Barbara Snyder. Why was Ron taken the way he was? I don't know. I don't know. You know, we, we don't know the answers to these things. And so we don't always have to have the answer. But what people are looking for is some hope and some direction. We can do that. And so I, I want to arm our members to be a witness wherever they are. I don't want our only lighthouse to be at 154 Chestnut Grove Road. I want our lighthouse to be everywhere we all are. Okay, that makes sense? That's the philosophy of ministry. So what's the purpose? They say letter A, to teach the word. And of course we're to teach the word. That's what we do in our services. Letter, um, uh, I'm sorry, I got my pages out of whack here. No, I don't. Uh, number one there, first priority is perfecting the saints. Uh, the teaching takes in all the counsel of God. This will include the teaching of doctrinal truth. And I, I agree with all those things. It's important that we're teaching the word. I talked Sunday about how important it is uh, that when we get together for services, it's the word that we're focused on, not philosophy, not how to be a great husband or how to be a successful employee or how to be a good citizen. All those things are really important. But if we get the doctrine part right, if we get the word right, those other things begin to fall into line. Letter B, another purpose of the church is corporate prayer. Of course it is. And that's why we're here tonight. This is our prayer, prayer service. That's why we have prayer breakfast and things like that. Letter C, the final purpose is worship. And uh, I, I, again, I probably have those in a different order. You know what I mean? We worship through studying the word and through praying. But uh, is worship. Um, number one there. Soul winning and missions is the responsibility of the church. Of course it is. It is our responsibility to do that. Um, uh, we worship through our body and the way that we represent ourselves. We worship with our money and the fact that we support then the work of the ministry. We worship through praise and thanksgiving. And then we, uh, we worship by doing good, uh, by, by showing the love of Christ to others. And we could go back to like the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Which one was the neighbor? Which one was the example? It was the one that stopped and helped and went out of his way. So those are some of the ways that we worship together. All right, number three, where do I fit into the church? Letter A, every believer has part, a part to do in the body. Each member has a different function. God's given us all spiritual gifts, things to do. Uh, no one member can function alone. Of course not. Each member's part is important. A properly functioning body operates as a unit. And so that's why, again, we're a body. The, bi the body principle is best practice in a local church setting. One thing every believer can do is be faithful in attendance. And so to be here, to pray, to worship together, to sing, to study, to give, those are all different aspects of what we're doing as we're worshiping. We can talk about that in a few minutes. We should grow in our relationship to the Lord and learn what our strengths and gifts are. All right, number four. Number four is just a kind of a, a question about, you know, people being attached to their local church. What if I have to relocate? Being in a good local church is critical. Anytime you have to locate, find a good Bible-believing church to be part of. That should be a priority. So letter A, we should seek the Lord for wisdom and guidance. Where, where to go? 
what church he wants me to be a part of. What is it he wants me to be plugged in at? We should look for evidence of evangelism and outreach. You know, um, and I think that's a, a, a big thing today. I think even, and I'll be honest with you, even your more, some of, some of your more contemporary churches are changing their focus a little bit today by saying this. We need to be a witness in our community. We need to be involved in our community. Uh, I do think there's two different ways churches do that. And I think that we need to make sure whatever we're doing in our community is an opportunity to point people to Christ. All right? So I know a church, a big church in Westminster, Maryland, that every fall has a big classic car show on their church parking lot. People in the community, they all bring their classic cars. They give them ribbons and, and, uh, and awards and all that stuff and rank them all. Uh, but there's one requirement to be part of it. We're going to feed you, and you have to listen to our message. You have to listen to the message. Because they're not really concerned about old fancy cars, right? We're concerned about souls, right? So I, I, do you see the emphasis there? I, I think we have a tendency sometimes in churches, um, and I'm saying that in a broad sense, to, to not do that. You know, we have some outreach to the community, but it just becomes, um, you know, I'm thinking of a church down the street from me that has like a summer fair for the, all the neighborhood kids. It's a one day outside thing where they have like a, you know, a little a blow up, all the big blow up toys, bouncy house and slides and dunk tank and whatever they have out there set up in the parking lot. And the, you're, you come, you go through all this stuff, you leave. Well, we're not here to just entertain the kids. Right? That's not our primary goal. We need to be giving them the gospel. And so I think there's an emphasis on how, how we're reaching out to the community. What are we doing with it? What's, what's the motive there? Let her see. We need to make sure the leadership, this is again looking for a church. Make sure the leadership believes the word of God and encourages people to read and study it for themselves. And so one thing I've said a lot lately, especially during the whole pandemic, is, you know, you and God should be more than enough if that's all you have. If you can't come to church for whatever reason, and we see that. There's a lot of reasons people can't come to church. We all dealt with that for 11 weeks. But before that, there's people that end up in nursing homes or in the hospital or, uh, you know, somehow in isolation or in prison or whatever. They end up in a different place and they can't go to church. Then me and God have got to be enough. If that's all I have, it can be. It should be. You know, I gave the example of my mom on, on Sunday. I think that was a good one. Let her eat. We need to look for a church that's engaged in worldwide missions. And so missions is an important part. Oh, letter D was uh, ministers one another's needs, be concerned about one another. And letter E is worldwide missions. And that's why, you know, I'm always encouraged by the fact that our church supports so many different missionaries. And we support it out of our budget. It's a big part of what we do, how we do, and why we do what we do. Uh, we're very involved in missions, and I think that's, uh, that's important. So that'll wrap up that part of the lesson today.